a think tank dedicated to insightful, cutting edge, and inclusive research on policy issues regarding Taiwan and the world. ETI's mission is to enhance the relationship between Taiwan and other countries, especially the United States, through policy research and programs that promote better understanding about Taiwan. And ETI has a number of programs, including uh, frequent public seminars, like the one you're attending right now, our podcast series, and our bi-weekly Global Taiwan Group. I should say bi-weekly means once every two weeks, not <laughs> I'm very excited to take part in this discussion today on media infiltration campaigns in Taiwan by the People's Republic of China. Taiwan is one of the most vibrant and competitive mass media environments in Asia. Countless online, online publications, as well as 18 24 hour private video and news channels, bring constant updates and stories to a hungry domestic audience. <laughs> Yet, the landscape is littered with semi invisible Chinese influence. Taiwan's loose regulation and economic dependence on China. Left openings for United Front actors to shape the narrative, which, when coupled with waves of disinformation on social media, leave large opportunities for the CCP to uh, sway the mainstream narrative. As Beijing expands its media influence efforts across the globe, I think it's more crucial than ever to draw lessons from the experience of its priority target. And that is exactly why we're here today. As for the format of today's discussion, We'll begin by introducing the panelists one by one, and they will make opening statements based on their area of expertise. Uh, after which, I will briefly and selfishly ask a few questions. Of then I turn it over to the audience. And if you're watching us online, you can ask questions by typing them in the YouTube chat. You can tweet at us, tweet at us at Global Taiwan, or I think you can even email us at contact at global.taiwan.org. That's contact at global.taiwan.org. So without further ado, I will introduce our first panelist, Kosh Ling. is a Raging Kleshel Democracy Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, where she's analyzing Taiwan's management of COVID-19 to understand the nation's strong democratic performance at a time where other democracies have been faltering around the world. She's previously worked as a deep reporter at the Taipei Times, I'm sure. Many of you will recognize the largest English language daily publication in Taiwan. And at the Taipei office of Kyoto News, which is the largest and oldest museum. For coverage of cross strait relations and Pacific politics, Xu Ling has been awarded a Jefferson Fellowship at the East West Center. And she has also served executive committees at the Association of Taiwan Journalists, the East West Center, and the Taiwan Foreign Correspondence Club. As such, I'd like to turn to Xu Ling for an introductory overview the media landscape in Taiwan. Um, thank you for inviting me, John. Um, today, I will talk about PRC's to um, China claims Taiwan as part of its territory to reunite it with mail, of course, necessary. In addition to military coercion, Beijing has invested heavily in warfare to like public opinion. With major elections held every two years in Taiwan, it is important to understand the primary as this information campaign and the methods is equally important in Taiwan. Of course, to black lines information. These are state agencies and state owned media. Second, traditional government and social media platforms are followed by legitimate government. Commercial media, marketing and public relations companies patrons of Canada. And fourth, social media and commercial companies. These actors operate in four ways. First, central government spreads information through traditional media. Again, lot of partners do the same, but in a less organized fashion. Third, social media influencers spread this information generated by content farms while making it for issues. And finally, actors work together to distribute this information in a hybrid, funded by China manner. The last mode often involves the uh, China's operations in Taiwan are multi-faceted. 
thinking from the co-opting traditional religious groups or business associations to organizing cultural activities, offering incentives in the tourism and entertainment industries, and influencing the outlets with Chinese business interests. China's response to Chinese disinformation is also positive. It is also helped by the fact that Chinese themselves grow more patriotic. With each new generation more identified as Taiwanese, not as Chinese, as far as Westerners. So when citizens involves civil society groups. In 2018, two organizations, Taiwan Media Watch and the Association for Quality Journalism, established the Taiwan Fact Check Center for the negative impact of false information and enhance the information literacy of the public and foster the democratic development of Taiwan. Taiwan authorities also monitor those vulnerable to from military personnel, many of whom side with counterparts in the People's Liberation Army, the business people interests make them parts of Chinese origin. In 2008, for example, Taiwan businessman Tsai uh, Yaming, founder of a rice cracker company um, with most of its market and production facilities. Uh, China purchased two Taiwan TV stations and a newspaper which was a business aid. All of them harsh critics of the current DPP government, which is more skeptical of both ties with China. Given the seriousness of those questions, Taiwan established a cabinet position responsible for policy involving telecommunication, cyber security, and communication industries. The current Minister of Digital Affairs of Chang designs software to identify and respond quickly to Chinese information while stopping the collective messages with a more ancient visual. Companies also develop platforms to facilitate governance, expanding transparency, and reducing the sources of all price. media while avoiding the vision caused by implicating Twitter and Facebook and encourage contentious postings because they generate revenue. How to invest input on policy issues while eliminating the reply option. And so the spiraling rage often generated in the work of commercial apps. Trump also measures neither the opinions of respondents nor their understanding of facts, but rather how they feel about eliminating the reply option. Trump reduces destructive emotionalism, producing what she calls broad consensus that helps makers to develop programs that may not be ideal for everyone, but provide solutions both to hope I'll stop here. Thank you, Shulin. I think that's a great overview of how the PRC conducts uh, influence campaigns in Taiwan and both how the government and civil society have responded. Now, but I've been more in depth into that and how the PRC influences the narrative and sentiment in Taiwan and the region. I'd like to turn to our second panelist, Amber Lin. Amber, who is generously joining us from Taiwan, where it is, it is M9PM. It's a journalist specializing in cross-strait relations and regional politics. She's worked at a number of Taiwanese publications, including Commonwealth Magazine, The Reporter, and Newslines, all of which are often cited as some of the most trusted news outlets in Taiwan. She's earned a few too many journalistic awards for me to list here, but trust me, they are a lot and they are impressive. In 2019, she got a uh, Pulitzer Center for Se Persephone Mel Fellowship for her project, The Silent War, which explored Beijing's growing economic and political influence campaigns in Taiwan, as well as the island's response. Currently studying politics and security 
the Age of Studies program at Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service, as such as I Okay, um, thank you, Joanna, for the introduction. Uh, morning, everyone. Thanks, GTI, for hosting this seminar, and thanks for having me. Sorry for not being able to participate in this event in person since I'm in Taipei now. So today, I would like to share my on-the-ground observations on how China used hybrid channels to enhance their influence operations in Taiwan and the region. Um, I am an investigative journalist who focuses on the CCP's infrastructure of the grassroots, especially the local political and religious systems. So I'm not an expert of Taiwan's media or the, the CCP online disinformation campaign. However, when discussing China's media infrastructure, we cannot ignore how the CCP uses the grassroots channels as its propaganda tool. Therefore, I argue that the CCP's influence operation must be viewed holistically rather than by industries or sectors. So before delving into the overall introduction, I would like to define the term media first. From my perspective, the definition of media is broader in the sense of the digital era. I consider media to include traditional media, social media, and even chat groups like blind groups, Facebook fan pages, and WeChat group that the CCP can utilize for propagating their information, ideology, and interest. Therefore, when I say media, I'm including all these non-traditional forms, as I prefer to call them channels or platforms. Second, the key element of the CCP's influence operation is language. It is to say Chinese language is the strength of the CCP's infrastructure campaign against Chinese native speaker. The CCP has always been very aware that language can convey not only information, but also the assumptions, values, historical narrative, ideology, and implication of words behind the language. So they believe that one owns the, the authority to interpret the language must be one in power. We can see how Beijing intentionally utilizes the power of language to alter people's perception of things. For example, the CCP has its own definition of human rights and democracy, such as Chinese style democracy and Chinese style human rights. Therefore, we can see that the main target of the CCP's infrastructure um, in the region is the Chinese speaking community. Um, in my observation, the most successful CCP infrastructure is among Chinese speakers. Any Chinese language channel can be used as a platform for spreading their ideology or narrative. So overall, there are some typical approaches to China's media infiltration in Taiwan and the region. The first approach is direct intervention. Um, the CCP uses pro-Beijing agents to buy Taiwan's media outlets, intervening in the newsroom directly. Um, as Su Ling just mentioned that this story, so I won't repeat, but this approach in my view is probably less effective than before since the civil society and the government have become more worried about the media accusation. It has become easier for the government to target and supervise Chinese capital flows to Taiwanese media through proxies. And the second approach is indirect influence. Chinese official invites Chinese language media outside of China to travel to mainland in the name of exchanges. And it hosts the World Com Conference on Chinese language media. This approach helps indirectly influence the angle of media reporting on China, telling positive story about China. However, along with more and more investigations and public notice, Beijing's approaches are much more subtle now. From my observation, the third approach is shifting its infiltration from national to local. In Chinese, we say breaking up the whole into parts. The CCP's infiltration in media outlets is not limited to national level. 
It also aims to penetrate the local media platforms such as community newspapers, underground radio stations, or individuals like YouTube influencer and the social media's key opinion leaders. So these new tactics target a more diverse yet niche audiences, which is cheaper and more effective compared to mainstream media's acquisition. Last but not least, the final approach is grassroots infiltration. Pro-Beijing proxies help set up close chat groups among the grassroots community using Line or WeChat to disseminate the CCP's information or disinformation content. Due to its covert nature and lack of revolution uh, relevant uh, regulations, this is the most tricky approach to pre prevent and track. So in sum, there are three key takeaways of Taiwan's lesson. The first lesson is engagement is the easiest and fastest way for the CCP to penetrate foreign societies. In the past, cross-trade relations were characterized by no exchanges and no contact between the CCP and the KMT during the Cold War. So the CCP's infrastructure in Taiwan was limited. In 1987, when the two sides of the Taiwan Strait opened up for a family visit and up until the Ma ying government came to power in 2008, cross-trade exchanges were unilateral with Taiwanese tourists and businessmen traveling to China. However, during the era of cross-trade exchanges in 2008 to 2016, the CCP officials came to Taiwan frequently at that time, along with Chinese tourists and students, the deepening of the CCP's United Front operation against Taiwan began. Chinese officials directly visited grassroots village chiefs, the Taiwan temple system, and local political actions. It provided Beijing an excellent opportunity to establish a new United Front network within Taiwan society. This grassroots network is actually the base of the CCP's propaganda campaign in Taiwan now. The second lesson is the government's need to notice the new way of funding. With the development of technology, there are many different ways for China to provide funds to their agents through YouTube, digital currency, or even blockchain instead of through the traditional banking system in the digital era. It is increasingly difficult to follow the money. The last lesson is strengthening the awareness of the civil society. The CCP usually penetrate open society with legal activities and using gray areas. Given the characteristic of China's media expression, the regulation sometimes cannot effectively prevent its operations. Therefore, strengthening the awareness of the civil society is crucial to counter the CCP's infiltration. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And I think that by spotlighting the grassroots nature of infiltration efforts, I think you've led us perfectly into our next panelist, uh, who is Rita Chung. Uh, Rita is a senior data journalist at the Asia Fact Check. Check lab of Radio Free Asia. Before settling in the U.S., she worked for the Central News Agency of Taiwan as a correspondent for Washington, D.C., Shanghai, and Beijing. Her coverage has spanned from cross-strait relations and U.S.-China relations to the social events and human rights issues in China. In 2023, her project on China's birth control policy was recognized as a silver award winner for human rights reporting at the New York festivals. And she has a presentation for us, which is being pulled up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, GDI, and thank you for having me back. Uh, so much of that, maybe. Yeah, And then maybe I can, yeah. Today, I will just focus on the content infiltration. And if you want to uh, know more about the systematically how the PRC media do, uh, I would recommend the journal's uh, research paper that I spread on the PKS website. Uh, I would recommend everyone to go to the PKS website and then, yes, yeah, I would focus on what the contents, the quotation that the PRC media have. Uh, um, 
let me introduce uh, my, my media in Asia, or whatever. Uh, Asia Fair Chapel Lab is a new project that the radio Asia just launched last October. And I think um, it's starting from the pandemic that we we found we found that it, it's become very clear that the Chinese state media uh, were probably geared up not just to burnish its reputation, for instance, marketing its generosity and the soft power, uh, helping other countries by donating the thing, but to spread the false rumors and the narrative about the origin of COVID and the point their uh, fingers on the United States. Uh, we call this like muddy the water. Yeah. And uh, we are a small team. We have uh, nine people in total in Taiwan, Hong Kong. Yeah, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. And then, yeah, what do we do? The, we decode the China's information operation at home and abroad. And then we can talk about that uh, a little bit later in detail. And then also we monitor the Chinese media and the influencers. And then especially some like a special project that we have done. Uh, and we found out that what happened in Taiwan are also happening in some other countries that uh, recently we just uh, thinking what the Chinese state media have done in Malaysia and uh, New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Next. And uh, let me give you some examples of what we have done. Uh, the first one is about the uh, President Tsai's uh, over in, in New York City recently. And then we found that from the CCTV and people staying daily during uh, her transit, uh, during her transit, uh, the Chinese media say that President Tsai was coolly received by the crowd of protesting Chinese who look at her like a rat in the street. Of course, it's not true. But we we said when we found that it's like online and offline of combination operation, it's because the, the Chinese night in front did send some people to protest her. And then in Chinese officials narrative, they call it a her transit as a, like a mouse visit in Chinese for Twan Twanbang. It's a very negative description. And then and then the second example there, sometimes uh, we also to do the uh, fact check to uh, arm the Taiwanese political commentators. <laughs> Although um, I think for uh, President Ma's visits to mainland China, uh, it's not unusual to become a, like a partisan issue in Taiwan, but uh, as a fact check entity, I think it is still important to point out that something was not right from the Taiwanese political commentators narrative. And then we found a very interesting point is uh, another commentator, Chou Yi. I think that, yeah, I don't know whether we should call it like a dark, deep, deep, deep blue, or a little bit like a great, great commentator. That he also criticized President Ma. He uh, didn't, um, didn't talk about the unification publicly enough. And he criticized he was not brave enough. So, um, we, we call this like the problem of the information cocoon. And this problem is more serious in chi China, especially for the Chinese reader. It's because uh, we all know that uh, in China, there is only one narrative allowed to broadcast. So that's why sometimes uh, the Chinese people cannot hear the uh, different or diver diverse diversities opinions in Taiwan. So that's a problem. And then the third one, I would like to say that's the CCP's main goal to try to try everything that they can to eliminate the, the overthrow the legitimacy of Republic of China, Taiwan. And for instance, uh, recently the Chinese official completely asserted that terrible declaration and the false and declarations are two historical documents which prove that mainland China holds tradition over Taiwan. But of course, it's not true. But from our perspective, we thought that Chinese uh, official think if they can repeat their narrative for 100 times, it can become like a true as their strategy. Yeah, so at this. And then what's China's goal? Uh, we found um, from Chinese narrative, we found maybe three. And the first one is like uh, US will abandon Taiwan one day. 
So recently, we found uh, Apple uh, explained a free approach first. Uh, we found that China will first one to produce, uh, second to distort, and the third is to manipulate the beast and the misinformation. And there are two categories of beast and misinformation. One is from the officials, and the other is from the civil society or just ordinary Chinese people. And in Chinese, we call it Ming Yao or Guan Yao. And then the first one is like the uh, Chinese for visual disinformation and misinformation, but it's based on the US media. Although it's not a mainstream media, but it's an online website that recently that the, the messenger, the, the website is called the messenger, it say that the US is preparing evacuation plans for American citizens in Taiwan. Um, it's a complicated issue, but uh, the, the Chinese uh, official uh, spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Wang Wenbing, criticized that the U.S. just used Taiwan as a pawn to serve the U.S. strategy of containing China. And I, I think that's the goal that for the Chinese official to create the skepticism for the United States of supporting Taiwan. And then, unfortunately, some of the Chinese fight it. Yeah. And then that's another way to muddy the water as well. And then we call it that's like a distortion. And then the second one is that uh, China is also work, work, working very hard on magnifying controversial issues. For instance, like the, this one uh, is like they protect the Taiwanese police officer, uh, us US police officers as well too, while they are doing the law enforcement. But, if you go into the detail of the content, uh, there are a lot of false, false, false food. The first, the, the Chinese lady wasn't there. And the second one, she was suffering the drug addiction. And then uh, she's not indigenous people as well, but it was uh, presenting a lot of uh, misinformation in China's uh, India's report. And then also that I remember while Taiwan was suffering the egg shortage, Problems. Uh, the Douyin and the TikTok was were full of the means and disinformation as well. And so to create this kind of to create this uh, this uh, information the ecosystem, China is trying to deepen Taiwanese people's anger or distrust toward the government. Uh, that's what, uh, that's is another example of the information conflict. And then yeah. And the third one is, um, I think it's also important that it's because uh, while Paris have like a, a serious protest a few months, ago, a few weeks ago, and Chinese media and then and, and, and also the TikTok Douyin uh, are, are creating that Western countries are in chaos. Because um, why it's important is because uh, I remember saying that we, Taiwan and China both uh, read and talk in, in Chinese. And a lot of Taiwanese people are reading Chinese media as well. So it's influenced the way and how the Taiwanese people feel the war. And then that's, that's uh, create, create an, another skeptical of democracy. And we think that it's, I found that it's a, also a, a serious issue in Taiwan. And that's. So uh, let me. I think that Amber has touched a little bit already, but um, I would like to give you a, a Chinese scholar's uh, word. Uh, Yu Xintian, she is uh, the director of the Shanghai Taiwan Institute. She said recently in her research paper that making full use of new technology and means, we need not only Xinhua news agencies for stating government's position, but also the social media platforms such as Douyin and IG in order to counter counter Western competitive warfare on China. Yeah, Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, researcher and then fellow also notice about the competitive warfare, but they using, of course, they will use in their way to counter that. Uh, but they, um, I would like to give you a one personal example as well. That's a conversation between my dad and me last year. <laughs> he said, it's from line in Taiwan that people use line quite often. And line is like a WhatsApp, a WhatsApp the Taiwan's version. And then he told me, oh, let me share one song with you. It's a good song made by Jay Cho. And the, 
of the electoral event. Uh, this is the name of the song. It's called Message, Message, Message to the Taiwanese Young Generation. But when I click it, uh, this song actually is full of like a criticism uh, to the older uh, Taiwanese politician, and then no Taiwanese politician did anything good to Taiwanese young generation, but especially they are criticizing the government. It's about, and then also they promote the to persuade Taiwanese uh, young generation that you don't have to fight for your your country. And then after five five seconds, I, I, I just realized because for me it's very easy that because this song was written in simply by the Chinese. But my dad didn't notice about that. And then of course this song is not written by the J Cho. It was remixed by some like a Chinese uh, uh, songs writer, and then I just tell my dad, um, do you notice that it's written in a, like a simplified Chinese? And also, I think it's like a combinative warfare. We are under under that. So I think uh, why we are doing the bad chat is because we think that media literacy, literacy matters, especially that we are we are going to have another presidential election soon, and we think the component of warfare will be like a daily basis. So um, if something that I can I can suggest and is the media literacy matter, apart from that, and we everybody has the duty to to do the fact check and then to talk to communicate with your family, friends, um, both the media's uh, access, you, you have to trust but verify. That's very important. So yeah, we can, yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions and the comments. Yeah, so. Great, thank you. Um, and as you say, these operations are not just limited to Taiwan. Not only does the PRC use foreign media outlets as a tool, it also tries to influence other nations around the region and other nations around the world. So as such, I'd like to take a step back and discuss the global implications of PRC influence campaigns to do that, our final panelist is Kevin Shai. Kevin is the Deputy Director for the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. Kevin served nearly 15 years in the U.S. government within the State Department's China Desk and Global Engagement Center in positions at the U.S. Op at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, Department of Defense, and uh, with the U.S. House of Representatives. He's proficient in Mandarin and has often spent his summers teaching in Xinjiang, China. His writings have also appeared in War on the Rocks, The Diplomat, Asian AK, and the International Forms Platform. So, Great. Thanks, John. I appreciate the, um, the introduction. Um, I think the older I get and the more gray hairs I get, the worse the Chinese kids. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe, probably this would have been published in like one spoke Chinese. But um, before kind of taking that broad track and jumping into some things I'm here to chat about, uh, Mike, who's me close to the mic, or is that you? No, it should be good. Okay. Um, just to really uh, thank the previous panelists for some of their analysis. That was really spot on. I thought, um, you know, Rita's description of, of, of what's happening and, and what they're doing in the fact checking side is, is critically important. Amber's analysis of, um, of sort of uh, what's happening at the local level was, was really spot on. I appreciate Shuling's emphasis on increasing skepticism. I thought that really stood out for me as an important goal for a lot of civil society and government work uh, on countering some of these different threats. Um, so, you know, as we've kind of heard from others, and I don't presume to be a, a Taiwan media expert, but, you know, clearly Taiwan has been in Beijing's crosshairs for decades in a whole range of sectors. And really, no entity feels this more than such stark relief given Taiwan's language and cultural ties, and obviously the military pressure coming from Beijing as well. At the same time, though, Taiwan really has such an incredibly strong economy and capable governance structures with, with really a lot of very strong political, economic, and societal resources to bear on this situation. Um, a lot of people, I think, around the world don't quite uh, appreciate Taiwan's strength in, in this regard. I think Taiwan really has a, a very unique opportunity to not just be a part of, but really to help catalyze and in some cases lead global responses to the CCP's malign influence. I think this is a no-brainer option for Taiwan and a no-brainer for the whole community of democracies to really embrace Taiwan's potential role. First, I think Taiwan should find every way it can to enmesh itself into the broader community of democracies, finding new allies and new ways to regularize its interactions across a whole range of sectors. 
This is not an easy task. I mean, clearly, Beijing is pressuring a lot of countries to isolate Taiwan, but this type of approach provides additional deterrent value to Beijing's provocations, and in particular, I think slowly removes some of the taboos around the world that some countries have in associating with Taiwan. Two, um, democracies need the expertise and experience that Taiwanese officials and civil society members like these three panelists have, and that they can bring to the problem set of the CCP's malign influence, um, especially so in the information realms we're talking about today. I think the combination of Taiwan's inherent knowledge of the CCP and China generally and firsthand frontline experience in addressing it in droves really gives it unique value to the rest of the global community of small D Democrats that are suddenly forced to deal with new challenges like PRC state media and roads into media markets, licensing and content sharing arrangements. These are things that aren't just happening in Taiwan, as we know, these are happening globally and increasingly so on the global side. Other, other things we've, we've noticed as trends is co-optation of political and business leads through China's United Front work. We heard about that earlier in Taiwan. That's happening globally. Domestic political forces that might be closer relations with Beijing will inevitably lead to less pressure from Beijing in, this world, in these realms. That's a false choice I think a lot of countries um, make, unfortunately, on their own. We've learned that's not the case with Taiwan. Um, I thought of really great Taiwanese organizations are already undertaking some of this work. Uh, to name one that Xu Ling referenced earlier, Double Think Lab, the Taiwanese research organization specializing in the PRC's information operations and doing research in that regard. Um, they've pulled together a global community of activists, scholars, media, and some government officials together to share experiences and learnings on this challenge. They've worked with partners on every continent now to launch a new product that measures the PRC's impact in every sector of society for 80 plus countries. That's a lot. It's a big endeavor. It's a big research project. Um, recently, uh, on, at the International Forum, we had their uh, co-founder on our podcast, along with two other researchers who are also working on this issue, catalyzing their own society's responses to China's malign influence um, in other regions. And we asked them what they thought were the key point of expertise about China that civil society and government needs to understand in order to address China's malign influence activities, meaning what's the most important thing you need to know. And their founder, his name is Titi Ka, he suggested and, long, and he actually had the exact same answer as the two other interviewees we asked. And he said it's the knowledge of China's political system and the ability of China's United Front activities to impact every sector of its engagement domestically and abroad. That's really interesting. It's really the knowledge of how the party interacts with so much of the Chinese state inter apparatus at home. And then ultimately now as China's impact globally has just catapulted how that happens abroad. Scaling this type of expertise, which I think Taiwan has really essential knowledge about it's critical. It can enable Taiwan to build bridges that are crumbling or not existent with new partners abroad, and it can empower those societies' individual responses to the same threat. Then we're funding a, a number of organizations well outside of Taiwan to do this work as well, so it's not certainly not Taiwan's work, work alone to do. Second, let me kind of take a little bit broader view um, and uh, talk about generally some lessons that we in our network at NED have learned on how to best successfully counter foreign influence operations in the information in the information realm. Um, this past year, we published a report where we did an extremely deep dive in, into Ukraine's response to Russia's interference in its media and online domains, both what's happening covertly underneath, you know, with box trolls, et cetera, and also overtly through Russian state media. This is a result of a number of convenings that we had, as well as some really in-depth interviews with a whole range of Ukrainian civil society and government actors. And the three conclusions of this report are this. The most important things that, that civil society and specifically needs in order to be able to counter these types of really acute threats coming from a foreign authoritarian actor are one, deep preparation for fundamental crises and challenges. I'll go into that a little bit. Two, New and sustained collaborations among local civil society organizations, international groups, and when it makes sense, with government actors. And three, use of new advanced technological tools, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning tools to scale their analysis and ultimately to scale their response and messaging back populations. So before honing in on that first conclusion about deep preparation and specifically the role of the national community, um, the U.S. and others, it's pretty clear that Taiwan has a unique, effective, and I think innovative model for collaboration. Julian referenced it a little bit. Um, a report that uh, NBR, National Bureau of Asian Research, put out in 2021 spoke about this model, and it was really cleverly done, and I encourage you to check it out. It talked about the establishment of Taiwan's disinformation coordination team, 
the creation of a minister without portfolio, which is Lo Ping Chung, the overseer, and the government's ability to definitely leverage this expertise of civil society, which as we all know is quite vibrant in Taiwan, while still maintaining appropriate distance from civil society to, main, to ensure that civil society maintains the credibility that it needs um, with populations to provide that additional voice uh, about what's happening and also maintain its role in holding government accountable. That relationship between civil society and government is always tricky in some societies as governments change with civil societies that enduring messenger and enduring entity within, within, a, within a society's response to these issues. I think there's clearly a lot that the rest of the world can learn from Taiwan's model here, even among democracies that aren't undergoing the same type of acute foreign military and information pressure that Taiwan is experiencing from China, uh, Ukraine experienced from, uh, and is experiencing from Russia. So in our report, our Ukrainian and civil society experts highlighted the incredible value of preparation since 2014 when the Euromaidan revolution occurred. Um, specifically, so what, is, what does de-preparation really look like? A few things that we found. One is foreign investment in media support and development. Doing the type of investments to maintain independent media, to make sure they operate, to make sure they're able to be self-funding over time, to make sure they compete in an era where they're now competing against every subsidized state media um, options like RT, your Sputnik on the Russian side or the Chinese side with CGTN, CRI and the like. Two, testing your audience. Making sure you as a civil society or other media organization know that your message is actually having impact. Best way to do that is through public, through, through public polling, but there's a lot of other really interesting ways to do that um, in the context of, of, of uh, organizations messaging. Three, tested partnerships. Making sure that partnerships among civil society organizations move across sectors and are innovative and constantly adapting. So how does a fact check center like what Rita's uh, working on, how do they get their, their messaging into other media uh, outlets? to where it's not just, okay, we're going to say, what, what is the truth and you have to come find us, but how do you bring it to those people? Um, how do you work with other business sectors and labor union groups? How do you do that offline and elderly or other populations that aren't really enmeshed in internet systems, um, whether that's you know outside of Taiwan, of course, in many places in the global south? Four, have regular and, and positive and constructive interactions between civil society and government. I talked about that appropriate distance sometimes it needs to be uh, maintained between civil society and government. And that's something that when we talked to our Ukrainian civil society organizations, they really felt strongly about. There's a lot of support, of course, in the national, in Ukraine, for Zelensky and everything that's happening there. But there's also skepticism about government, as there should be if there is coming from civil society. But ensuring that those, there's some measure of coordination there and that is sustained and it can be, they can be sustained through government transitions when, you know, potentially there's a change in government. Five, a population that's used to hearing from and trusting civil society voices, even in the midst of those government changes. And then six, um, establishing uh, function. Oh, six, really, what's interesting here is that um, over the last year, a number of civil society organizations within Ukraine have adapted to a wartime environment, adapted to new ways of doing, doing their work. So there's a lot of them have moved from being fact-checking organizations to being investigating war crimes from Russia, right? Uh, but that bit, that latent investment in Ukrainian civil society that's been happening since 2014, it was able really to adapt to new roles and new missions whenever crisis, like obviously what's happening there, really occurred. And those sort of long-term investments paid off because people were used to being civic activists. They were used to doing this type of work. They were used to collaborating. People were used to hearing from these organizations. And it really proved essential to really maintain a, a strong response to everything that's happened over the past year or two. Um, Ukraine really undertook a lot of systematic collaboration over the years with the European Union and a, and a variety of Central and Eastern European organizations, both in the official government realm and in the civil society realm. Obviously, I think Taiwan needs to be doing the same with the U.S., with Asia-Pacific allies, and a variety of European allies to regularize those interactions over the time. And obviously, that's a two-way street. They need, to, they need to be able to bring Taiwan into those organizations as well. Thank you, John. Great. Uh, thank you. And thank you all. I think that with the four of you, we've already gotten quite the comprehensive lay of the land of what's going on with PRC media efforts in Taiwan. Um, I know that the audience is eager to ask questions, but before that, I do have a couple of questions on my own. We'll try to keep it a little bit brief. Um, I want to first turn back to Amber. Uh, you studied the Paris campaign both in Taiwan and around the region. Uh, do you see a what specific factors make Taiwan unique when compared to other nations in the region? And how do ERC's efforts differ? How does Taiwan's response differ? Okay. Um, thank you for your question, Rona. 
Uh, well, I think the main differences is China's purpose toward different countries. For example, um, China's infrastructure into in the United States is aimed at stealing military or uh, business intelligence for great, great power competition. And China's goal to influence diaspora Chinese in Southeast Asia mainly targets political and business elites to facilitate its interest in the region. It also influenced the diaspora Chinese perception toward Taiwan and Hong Kong's democratic movement, marginalizing Taiwan's presence in the international community. And the CCP's infiltration into Taiwan is intended to influence public opinion and voters' choices during elections. So we all know that Taiwan has endured the most serious infiltration by the CCP in the world as we are the primary target. However, um, due to the unique nature of cross-ray relations, Taiwan does not have a large number of Chinese students studying here, nor does it have a significant Chinese immigrants population like some other countries. Moreover, given that the threat from China has been intense for decades, Taiwanese society is also the most aware of and actively responds to China's influence campaign. For instance, um, according to my investigation, the Chinese ambassador in Malaysia can directly call and intervene with the editorials department of Malaysian Chinese media and even Malaysian Chinese political parties. However, they cannot do the same in Taiwan. Um, the CCP actually needs to use more delicate and covert approaches. So in the past few years, I think Taiwan civil society has responded rapidly as um, all the panels uh, panelists has mentioned. I have interviewed an NGO that travels to various community association across the country to give lectures to the elders promoting the concept of identifying misinformation and helping clarify the fake news even seen by the elderly in line groups. So in my view, although Taiwanese society is divided by the CCP's infrastructure, but compared to other countries, there are still a certain number of Taiwanese citizens are immune and highly aware of China's influence campaign. Yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Great. Um, we touched a lot on the NGOs that are working to counter it uh, in Taiwan and around it. I think, Shuling, you've worked for a, a few NGOs in Taiwan that support journalists. I was wondering, can you uh, talk a little bit about what are the what are the specific advantages that civic society has over the government and why has it been able to so far? <laughs> Um, I've been an uh, English reporter for uh, local newspapers and international news agency since 2000. And uh, I want to 20 some years. Uh, one thing remains unchanged is the growing influence of the PRC. And this influence is most apparent in the media. Where pro PRC media outlets emerged to 2008 to coincide with a proliferation of PRC's efforts to promote uh, reunification and spread it pro independent views. Um, many Taiwanese journalists are routinely invited to participate in. Uh, junkets, summits, or other kinds of hatred to China produce uh, friendly news content. And uh, pro PRC businessmen and companies with ties to business interests and then in China own media outlets that either self censor or play subjects that Beijing leaders uh, sensitive. I give an example in my talk. 
Um, and this vulnerability to Chinese uh, influence has been compounded by um, the rise of social media uh, into a primary source of information for most Taiwanese. For example, Facebook um, has about 20 million users in Taiwan out of a population of 23 million. In line, um, the most popular instant messaging app among Taiwanese internet users has more than 22 million users. So there are other private message uh, groups on apps like WhatsApp and WeChat, um, which have been used to spread misinformation or disinformation more effectively than traditional media can respond. So how has Taiwan responded to the PRC's online information operations? Um, in my talk, I mentioned um, the, uh, I covered the, uh, the response of the Taiwanese who have become more patriotic. Um, so when they encounter Chinese misinformation or disinformation, they are more likely to call. I also covered the efforts of the government, which has become more vigilant in monitoring those who are vulnerable to Chinese recruit. Um, but I would like to add one more thing here, uh, which is that while it is valuable to identify the risk, such monitoring has limited use due to democratic principles like freedom of uh, speech that um, prevent the limit limit the government's ability to stop disinformation. And Tsai Yingbing is a very good example. Um, in 2020, after repeated warnings and fines, um, Taiwan's commun uh, National Communications Commission um, declined to renew the broadcast license of the cable news channel of one of Tsai Yingbing's media outlets, CTI News. Um, so after seizing operations as a cable news channel, um, it has continued to air its news program on YouTube. It also took the case to court. Um, and in May this year, the Taipei Bai Administrative Court overturned the FCC decision um, on the grounds that the decision was based on her criteria was illegal and must be revoked. And I also covered in my, book, uh, in my talk the uh, efforts taken by civil society. Um, so uh, two organizations established this Taiwan Fact Check Center, and I would like to add um, three more. Uh, one is the COFAX, uh, which was launched by Bob Zero, a community of tech professionals who promote open government and uh, participatory democracy. So uh, COFAX employs um, a crowd collaboration and uh, chatbots to review uh, information of unknown credibility. And volunteers analyze emotionalism and objectivity of suspicious messages of elements that are hard for artificial intelligence to identify. And the second one is fake news cleaner, which focuses on uh, teaching information literacy, especially to older people who will soon make 20% of Taiwan's uh, population and who have unwittingly um, become the distributor of fake news on social media, especially live. And so in um, uh, the third one is live. Unlike other platforms like Twitter or Facebook, uh, live 
cannot, it does not block this information or cancel the accounts that spread it. So in 2019, Line launched the uh, Line Fact Check, Line Fact Checker app. Um, it outsourced the uh, the job to fact checking organizations like Fake News Cleaner, uh, Colfax, and others. So, to your question, I don't remember what it was. <laughs> well, yes, I think that by touching on all various civil society organizations, it's. I think what you're what you're getting at is that civil society can be so much more innovative. I think. And multifaceted and government has the opportunity to be. Um, and you also mentioned that a lot of things have changed during your tenure as a reporter. And to that point, I wanted to ask Rita, uh, from your vantage point at the fact check, fact check lab, how have you seen influence efforts and the response to those influence efforts? What are the major trends and how are they how have they changed over the last few years? I think uh, now the current trends like um, the skepticism uh, for the United States and the democracy, like I, I just mentioned. Um, I'm not sure whether it's uh, in, it's the impact by the narrative that CCP is trying to promote. Mm -hmm. The East is rising and the West is the declining. I think it's because that mm -hmm. it's not just that Taiwan has like, a strong uh, economic fight with China. A lot of a lot of like the Southeast Asia countries also have a, a very, very close the economic relationship with China as well. So um, uh, one more interesting thing that I would like to point out that I'm actually say that the fact check. Um, during the COVID, we found that like for example, Vietnamese Finan government and Philippine government, the government, these government are running the fact check center. It's, a, it's like an official fact, fact check center. Uh, they they were focusing on the on the COVID and the vaccine because uh, there are also a lot of like amazing dis disinformation in Vietnam. It's very interesting about the people are very uh, skeptical toward the vaccine and vaccination. However, recently the a lot of human rights organizations um, present their concern that now the Vietnamese government is using the fact check as a tool to impress the, the people who have different opinion about the government. So actually say that it's, it's a challenge for the free freedom and open society that how can we uh, pre preserve the freedom of speech and then how, how can we fight against the disinformation as well. So it's, it's a big tricky and it's, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, I think that balance between free yeah. speech and correcting the pain uh, like a government saying what is a yeah. what is a fact and what is not a fact is certainly something that is would be right for controversy in basically every democracy. Speaking of democracies, my final question is to Kevin, uh, which is in your experience, what are the greatest vulnerabilities that democracy, small d democracy democrats face around the world uh, when it comes to countering Infiltration efforts, specifically by the PRC or yeah. Yeah, good question, and I'll be completely plagiaristic and steal a lot of analysis from uh, Freedom House here, who has a second version now of their Beijing Global Media Influence Report, which is really phenomenal. Highly suggested. Um, this last round, they put together fifteen or so, maybe twenty case studies from around the world and looked at each. These different countries' media sectors identified vulnerabilities, but also identified spots. So maybe I'll pick up a little bit as well in response. And some of these vulnerabilities are not unsurprising, where it's you know decline in independent media uh, and uh, you know dis rampant disinformation online. Sometimes what's surprising in some of these places is some of the the language issues. And Amber mentioned it earlier about the importance of on the Chinese diaspora. Some of the language issues where you have really only two options, kind of an undeveloped Chinese diaspora to be in, and then a highly domestic and information of native people state via a network you know, on the other end, and not a whole lot in between. Um, it's it definitely the case in a lot of these other places with um, where you know local languages, you know, whether it's in, in Africa, whether it's in you know certain parts of Central or Eastern Europe. 
elsewhere where those uh, it's not like Spanish language where it's, it's huge in Bolivia, it's something that can cross borders, but it's very localized, very hard to get um, foreign independent reporting on China into a place that only speak like a for example, uh, or other places like that. There's just not that much access. Obviously, pressure on foreign journals in China is a big reason for that. Um, and there's just not as much options. And so being able to understand what's happening in China is something that a lot of countries have a really strong desire for. And so when their only options are Chinese state media, then that's a bad option. You know, if we're really understanding what's happening in China and some of the risks and opportunities and kind of engaging with the PRC. Um, I think another vulnerability, and you sort of mentioned it briefly as well, is sort of you know, cracking down on specific, and specifically on freedom of expression. So some of these particular uh, trends that are happening in a lot of places are development of fake news laws, for example, and things like that, where there are disguised as ways to crack down on disinformation, whether that's domestic or foreign source disinformation or propaganda. It's a, it's a way to only crack up government views, uh, the domestic government views of what's happening and of, you know, crack down on free speech. Getting that balance right between freedom of expression and countering some of this disinformation and propaganda is a really, really hard problem. For me, the most important thing that I keep hearing over and over again in conversations is the importance of transparency. You know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, I say, this is absolutely this. And so when you look at across the sectors, uh, whether it's media, the government's role, civil society's role, technology platform's role, it's really transparency and exposure is really the key thread among so many of the different policies that have found to be effective labeling state affiliated media, and I mean affiliated as well, not just official, you know, sort of CTTM stuff, but I'm talking about people who are sort of parroting those, those things professionally or on YouTube are being paid to do that, which we're learning a lot now is happening more and more. You talk about YouTube does a pretty poor job of uh, labeling a lot of media, uh, as well as individual influencers uh, in this area. So that's something to work out as well. Um, I think one thing that was really interesting, and I'd be interested in, and maybe afterwards we can talk more about it, it's in, among media organizations in the, in the Philippines, they have a really interesting code of ethics of journalists regarding reporting on Chinese, um, on activities in China. I mean, talking about ways in which to investigate reporters and other journalists from the well board and doing so. Um, it's a really smart, Totally non-governmental initiative that's happened among the Philippine Journalists Association to provide some guidance to people journalists and how they report on China, how to not sort of run afoul of some of these issues where um, you're leaning on Chinese government information and where that might color your analysis and reports or dealing with issues related to exchanges back in China and being at paid trips for journalists that go back to China and come back and report differently on what's happening in China. Um, so anyways, those are a few things we can get into more and more of it if you like, or just go read the three and a half more. I'd like to shout out that well if you're researching Beijing influence efforts, it's probably going to end up being the backbone of the research. Um, and yeah, as you say, a lot of these outlets are, even if they're not state state owned or state officially connected, they end up parroting the state narrative. I think that a lot of the reporting on Xinjiang, particularly in Taiwan, has been sort of just reframing the CCP message. Uh, so. That was all the questions that I had planned. So I want to turn now to the audience. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand, uh, give your name, affiliation, and your question. And then also online, again online, uh, you can put a question in YouTube chat, you can tweet at us, Global Taiwan, or you can email us, contact at globaltaiwan.org. All right. Any questions? All right, thanks, uh, Aaron Kiesler from Tesla Government. Um, so, I think between the great discussion today and your the Institute's brief last week on PRC co option of Taiwanese media, you did a great job of helping us understand what's going on in that space. I want to get a better idea of the scale and reach of a lot of these kind of Chinese co opted media outlets in Taiwan. Is this like a loud fringe minority, or do they have a dominant position in Taiwan's? media ecosystem. And then obviously you've helped us uh, be aware of this, but to what degree is Taiwanese society aware of this issue? Thank you. Um, you know, I'd like to volunteer to answer that question. I think that both of you are equipped to do so. I, I don't know if I may answer your question 
apart from me. I think that um, for my previous uh, previous company, Central News Agency, that it was founded by the government, which is a kind of like a mutual as it is. It's not can do or can bring. Uh, of course, people can argue that it's like a pen to hold the government for whatever. But well, actually, I will I will say that it's it's not my case. But um, so that's why. Um, I think it's so like a very, it has become like a polarized uh, the media's in environment already. Like my dad, that he, he always read uh, like a United Daily or China Times. So sometimes I need to literate, uh, literate to literature him that, well, if you really want to know the whole picture of, of Taiwan ourselves, you better sometimes. I can read the Liberty Times. That's <laughs> you know the that's the full picture. It's, and also um, the skepticism toward the democracy that he has. Um, I will say that for like a senior people that they prefer like a more stable and um, no conflict the, the environment. But um, I was reminded him that if you you. You were in China. You don't even have the chance to to criticize the government. So think about that. And then, although sometimes the democracy is a little bit messy, but it's still worthy to have that kind of like a freedoms, freedoms, and then yeah, the, the environment. Yeah. I hope I answer your question. Um, and I'll briefly add just because I remember this statistic. Uh, I think a twenty twenty one poll found that eighty percent of Taiwanese believe that news media should be more regulated to counter PRC influence. So I think, particularly post the, as truly mentioned, the sort of want saga with Taiwan who controls a lot of media. There has been a lot of boost in public awareness since that. You know, can I add one very short but, thing? Is um, there's some research that's been done, I think it was in the African context, maybe Latin America, I can't remember the exact nature of it, but it talks about the importance of um, individual populations simply knowing that there is a disinformation problem. Like, it's a lot to ask an individual to know that, you know, China Radio International is a Chinese state of the entity, and that's another one that's not. That's a lot to ask an individual person, but simply having populations aware that this is a problem makes them skeptical when they approach any kind of information. And over time, builds in the notes of critical thinking, you know, all these things that the literature programs around the world are assigned to, to teach young and old people how to deal with these things. Um, so simply that a general awareness that there's a problem out there is hugely important for society responses to, to this issue, no matter where it's coming from. Anyone else? Right here. Hi, I'm Kevin Slayton from Freedom House. Uh, <laughs> The uh, Asian Regional Office and a project called the Chinese Summer Hunter. We gather our database of Chinese protest events and post it online. I'm writing a message right now to Sarah Cook from Rights PGMI that, hey, uh, that uh, people like her report. So thank you for, for upping that. Um, Freedom House has a whole bunch of data projects, as people might be aware. Another one is the Freedom on the Network. Well, PGMI, you should mention, tries to give some sort of number and uh, weight to both influence and resilience of different countries. And I think it's notable that, reflecting what a lot of speakers said here, Taiwan is both the highest in influence and in resilience, right? So it's China's main target, but it's also the most resilient in the ways that it's responded because it's a matter of life and death, it's existential. Um, and that makes Taiwan a really good place for learning how to respond to China's influence. Um, we actually have a project based out of Office of Taipei, a new project to try to um, encourage and facilitate Taiwanese NGOs that we've been talking about today to share some of those um, strategies with NGOs in other countries where Chinese influence also exists. Um, the other thing I'll say is the Freedom of the Net Report rates Taiwan as we're talking about the struggle between freedom, freedom of expression, and these measures. And Freedom of the Net uh, rates Taiwan as the freest internet in Asia, um, including the newest report. And yet it's still like 70 out of 100, which tells you a lot about internet restrictions, um, but also that a lot of Taiwan's struggle and most of the gap has to do with everything we're talking about today, because it has to make trade-offs. Um, so anyway, given that context, my question for you, I mean, we're all, it sounds like we're all really impressed and, and confident about the things Taiwan's doing uh, and civil society is doing, but the election is coming up really fast. And so my question, my general question to all of you is how confident are you 
that this resilience that we're talking about um, can prevent a major political impact from disinformation in the results of the coming election. Great question. That's not one. <laughs> In particular, we're talking a lot about the things that Taiwan has done, the Taiwan civil society has done to respond to this information, to make it more transparent and to try to, to uh, you know, the fact checking efforts. Um, and this is all true. And this things that have developed over the past year since the last election or two elections ago. So years of development of this sort of response has led to the current state, which is kind of impressive. Yet China is still really trying very hard to influence politics in the ways that we are talking about. So how confident are you or all of you that what's developed during these years is enough to stave off a major political impact? So there's going to be some political impact. Some votes are going to be changed. Is it enough? To really change the results, do you think it's enough to change the results of an election? It's just not enough. Um, I will begin with the uh, 2020 election. Um, many experts attributed uh, the unexpected popularity of Hanoi, um, the pro-China uh, candidate of three. Oh, I mean, the presidential candidate of the pro-China candidate. He, he attributed his unexpected popularity uh, partly to his populist appeal and partly to the uh, assistance of the open forces, a clear reference to China. And so now the 2024 elections are only a few months away. Um, I expect China to send out, send out some kind of a message that if the Taiwanese voters elect someone who is pro independence, then you will have another four years of gridlock or even uh, worse consequences. Um, it might not explicitly say so, but I think it will send a similar message. And so um, China, China weaponizes its information as um, what Chris Walker of the uh, National Endowment for Democracy describes as uh, sharp power using the openness of Taiwan's democratic system uh, on itself. So uh, Taiwan's, uh, China's online uh, information operations in, in Taiwan uh, are more high tested. As I, um, I said in my talk, Taiwan's response to um, China's malign uh, information operation is also more high tested. But I think Kevin made a very good point. I think um, as much fact checking um, as you can do, I think um, the key the key uh, point here is the best solution might be um, to deal with the problem at, at its core, which is to inoculate the people to resist um, revision that China seeks to exploit. Um, so Taiwan is on the front lines of China's information warfare. And uh, Taiwan has a lot of experience to share with the world as China uh, expands its influence efforts across the world. Great question. If I may, I would say that I'm quite confident about Taiwan's resilience. Um, it's, it's because uh, to me, uh, maybe you can call me a bit naive or too optimistic, but this is not our first presidential election. We have been through a lot of uh, a lot of elections already. So, but we have to bring the awareness to the people that there must be a lot of these and the misinformation ahead. And especially uh, the AI's technology is growing. Then, so, so that's why having this kind of panel is really important to bring the, like Kevin said, to bring the awareness to the civil society. So um, don't uh, be uh, skeptical a little bit to any video or, or audio or photo that you, 
you see, you watch, and then trust, and then verify the information. So, any other questions? I from from the, I have the question actually just the other way around from a gentleman who friend of ours said, what if this what if the administration change would that impact the sustainability of uh, the support of the um, comfort is this information or information or if the government change? This what if that have fact. Good question. So if we if we do see a, a TPP or administration. Is there any you guys foresee a change in how we might influence efforts? Any comment that you want to bring in Amber first? Go ahead, Amber first. Amber, did you hear the question? Sorry, I cannot hear the question very clearly. Um, the quality of connection is not very good. No worries. We, we've got it going to you in a in message form to our list. <laughs> Kevin, you can start. I'll start, but I really would I'm going to defer to my Taiwan colleagues who are talking to me specific about Taiwan politics. I'll just say generally that, you know, the point of investment in civil society efforts to counter these sort of things, discrimination, propaganda, like any regularization of relations hearing from civil society and voices, that transcends government changes and transcends the new administration. That's the point. I think. You know, I'm not a full expert in everything that Taiwan's done, but the story is quite impressive over what's happened in recent years. So when people are used to hearing from vibrant China, Taiwan, the Taiwanese media outlets, if they're used to hearing from black journalists, if they're used to hearing from researchers, if they, you know, if those investments, they'll, they'll pay off, even if the administration takes a different tack on some of these things um, and, you know, maybe allows more, you know, Chinese state media voices into the Taiwanese media ecosystem, et cetera. But that, that's the point of civil society investments. Um, and so I would, you know, uh, that, that's how that operates, national democracy, we invest in civil society because we, we believe in its power. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's potential there to really you know, transcend any sort of change in government. I'd like to give Amber the chance to chime in as well. If she needs to think about the question. Can you hear us, Amber? Sorry, I really can. The connection is really bad. Mm. So, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, so, the question is if we have a non DPP government after this election, mm -hmm. will that change how Taiwan deals with influence efforts? Um, you mean, is the government the key of Taiwanese attitudes that the question means? Uh, I would say that, yes, that's a piece of the question. Okay. Um, I would like to say uh, Taiwan's society's resilience is not just based on the governments, but also the civil society. So uh, I don't see if the government change uh, to a non-DPP government that uh, Taiwanese societies toward uh, China's influence campaign will change. And, uh, um, and in fact, I think um, China, uh, Taiwan's civil society probably will react um, like in 2014, the sunflower movement, uh, like uh, to protest or to against China's infiltration, if the government doesn't really have the protection measures uh, to the civil society. So um, I think Taiwan's civil society is still uh, resilient in this regard. Thank you. Um, and before we do more audio, we've Two questions from online, uh, one of which from Ethan Bong, intern at the US Taiwan Business Council. Um, he asks, should citizens of Taiwan address the PRC's disinformation by stopping the usage of apps like LINE and Facebook? 
And what is the trade off between completely cutting off the disinformation campaign through non usage versus removing a method of communication? I'll take that. I think the trade off is to be quite blunt values and democracy. I think um, there's a difference between censorship and removal of information and trying to out China, China, uh, and values freedom of expression. Raising the resilience of society, uh, you know, making sure that civil society and appropriate government voices are credible in society. I think that's the challenge: is how do you balance those two? I, I don't think the answer is. Uh, I think even you've seen us, and we had a test case now in Europe where you banned RT after the invasion, which is you would think would be sort of an obvious response, right? Sort of you know, a lot of the underground uh, or the uh, the underlying factors behind Russia's influence in Ukraine was a, as a result of its information influence activities and operations and RT was a point of spear for a lot of that. Um, the, the research has shown that in fact Russian uh, content or Russian state affiliated content still found a way within the European information ecosystem, even though RT and Sputnik were banned, there's a whole host of ways in which that information gets out. So it's not that effective to a certain extent. It also sort of belies the idea of an open information ecosystem where um, you know, uh, independent voices and accurate voices and information need to come better with other options that are out there. So I think the trade-off is quite significant, potentially harmful to the democratic models of governance because you know, when you start removing certain content, well, the next the next thing is well, let's let's say you have a you know, leftist or rightist administration, you know, into a certain country to suddenly start removing content that's uh, supporting one side or another. You just get into a really slippery slope when it comes to maintaining, uh, you know, democratic and fair models of instruction. I want to add it. Um, I, I agree with Kevin. This, uh, uh, we always say that don't become the one that you don't like. So, yeah, um, I still believe maybe that I'm just too optimistic. Taiwan has been a democratic country and it is robust and uh, it's vibrant democracy. So I still have confidence about the Taiwanese resilience. So just don't become the one that you don't like. Yeah. I think we have time for two more questions here, one of which I have another question from online. Um, this is a question from Alejandro Morales at the Landivar University of Guatemala, who asks in Latin American countries, does Taiwan have a foreign policy or diplomatic approach to counter PRC media infiltration? Um, we know that Paraguay is one of Taiwan's last remaining diplomatic connections. Are there any formal, I suppose, arms to counter influence? I think. Amber, you might, if you can hear us, you hear that question? <laughs> I try, but I'm okay. sorry. Let me, let me say it one time really. Really, does Taiwan have a uh, diplomatic arm in Latin America to counter PRC influence? Oh, wow. Well, I think this is, I'm not sure if I can answer this question. Um, to be honest, Taiwan's uh, diplomatic situation is very tough. Um, although uh, right now we have some support from the international community, but um, as my understanding, for example, in Southeast Asia, that uh, Taiwan's presence is always contained by uh, China's um, em Chinese embassy uh, in local. So um, I'm I'm not sure about Latin Amer American, but uh, I would say. Um, Taiwan, um, sorry, I don't, I, I'm not sure how to answer this question. I think it's out of my expertise. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I personally don't know a lot about the diplomatic arms in Latin America. I don't know if any of you do. I don't think there is much on the official side, but I say on the unofficial side, you know, what I mentioned earlier about some of the work by civil society organizations, our colleague with their freedom power over here, Peter Haas, I think mentioned that 
um, some of the work they're doing locally in terms of how to get their voices out to the rest of the world. Um, it's quite active and I think quite important. So there's a great opportunity on the civil society side to bridge those connections and to be a leader and a catalyst for the rest of the world's response to China's malign influence. Great. I think we have time for one last question, which will be our executive <laughs> director today. Okay. Um, thank you all. I'm Russell Chow with the uh, executive director of the Global Taiwan Institute. Uh, superb presentation, very enlightening. I learned a great deal. This is an area that I'm also personally very interested in, in researching. Um, I was especially uh, struck by the discussion about the PRC's use of social influencers. I think we saw in 2020, especially after the outbreak of COVID, when a lot of these three United Front exchanges went online because of the lack of exchanges, that there was a concerted effort to cultivate social influence either via, you know, sort of online talent development uh, forums, uh, you know, these competitions where they would invite, uh, you know, economies, uh, young uh, sort of uh, aspirational uh, um, celebrity uh, to become, um, you know, to, to train them to become social influencers. And I wonder to what extent after now, the, with the you know, end of COVID, there has been any noticeable changes in your observations of the PRC's effort to continue cultivating these influencers. You know, the last time I, I really kind of followed this issue was back in 2020 and noted a number of these United Front forums um, in you know, our global Taiwan briefs. And I wonder now, three years down the road, COVID ended, um, a number of you noted the use of social influencers. Whether you have any sort of more current, uh, you know, sort of information cases, uh, and maybe even to the extent of your uh, your assessment of the appeal and effectiveness of this particular vector of uh, of PRC's influence effort, because it is clear that the PRC is targeting the youth as a major vector in their uh, efforts to you know, influence Taiwan's population. And I wonder, from your very close observation and study of this issue, if you have any more sort of recent case studies, observations, and assessments about how the PRC uh, is utilizing this particular method and, and, and venue uh, for its uh, broader um, influence efforts on social media. Question. Thank you, Ross Wolf, for you got inviting me and then for your question. I think, like you say, for the young generation, we also found, uh, for instance, the social media like a little red book, the Xiao Hong Shu, and then the TikTok as well. It's it becomes uh, more and more popular in Taiwan, for, especially for the Taiwanese young generation. And then the strategy uh, the CCP uh, is using is now just. Um, it's not KOL key opinion leader or anything. Uh, they spread a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation for just for the ordinary ordinary people. And then who uh, we call it like decentralized because uh, every single um, TikToker and then the little random user can be a opinion leader. It's like a viral, one viral thing. So um, again, that's why that we say that this panel is important and the media literacy matters. So yeah, I'll leave on. Okay, uh, we have two minutes left, so. And the last question. <laughs> Maybe time to DTI. I am particularly struck by Kevin's uh, narrative of the Philippine in, uh, experience. They call it the ethics for the journalists. And I wonder if that is something that Taiwan can consider because it's so important because the PRC's United Front work penetrated down to the local the way grassroots all the civil societies that they got affected. Particularly the ever mentioned about the secret societies in the local local area. So I wonder if I was if they have any kind of suggestion or advice for the Taiwan authorities to work together and more closely with the civil societies. But all of the fact checks that they do the fact check by the time they fact 
the, the, the determined that this is this information is too late. It has widespread influence. In short, yes, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that was, um, I guess, discouraging from the Freedom House report, but hopefully an opportunity in the future, was that I think Philippines was the only one of the, the 20 countries that they analyzed that had something like this, whereas a, a journalist association initiated code of ethics for reporting on China. And they dealt with things like you know, um, you know exchanges and scholarships um, or where to find certain information or uh, what sort of organizations are state affiliated and one, which ones aren't. Uh, a whole range of issues that I think is really important. So it definitely is a potential model to, to emulate. I think, um, you know, for, for me and thinking more broadly about CCP's global influence strategies, it's a problem for every sector these days, to be frank. It's not just the media sector. There has to be things like this that's happening in chambers of commerce. There has to be things like this that's happening in government institutions, at, at local and state um, institutions as well that are sort of the recipients of BRI money. I mean, these sort of things have to happen across a whole range of different associations and, uh, and sectors to really sort of deal with the multifaceted um, risks and risks that's coming from China's global engagement. Um, it's really quite fast on a lot of societies and taking, taking a number of them by, uh, you know, uh, by surprise, I think. So I think that uh, these types of things need to be happening across sectors, no doubt. All right, well, I think that's just about our time. So if I get a quick round of applause for her. All real experts in what they do. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm sure that some people will stick around if you want to network exchange business cards. <laughs> and yeah, thank you all. Rippling, the one place where you can run all your HR, IT, and finance globally.